turn out. I hope everyone's able to go away with a, a bit of value from the day off farm. Um, yeah, so look, as, as Sally said, I'm with Men Livestock Australia. I'm a project manager within the adoption team, and I guess my key focus there is the southern rangelands and the southern half of WA, and really increasing engagement and um, adoption programs, the, the actual footprint of adoption programs we get in this part of the world. Um, in terms of my presentation today, I'll, I'll probably take a little bit different track to some of the ones we've seen this morning um, in taking a step back to how some of these research projects come to be, what that pathway is through industry, uh, and then focusing in on the adoption pathway and how, uh, I don't know, a couple of opportunities for producers to actually get directly involved with programs that are available here and now and hopefully quite relevant to yourselves. So first and foremost, Meat and Livestock Australia is a service provider to the red meat industry. We invest both government and industry funds to ultimately try and increase the profitability, sustainability and competitiveness of our product and do that covering goats, sheep and cattle. Where it all starts is, and, and all the producers in the room will be, will be well, uh, well aware of this, is the levy payment that comes off every transaction of, a, of an animal in Australia. So using lambing as an, as an example here, for every lamb sold, there's $1.50 that's paid as a levy. 37 cents of that comes to MLA into their research development and adoption group, which is the part of the business I work in. Um, and, and I'll go into a few examples of where that kind of money goes shortly. 90 cents to MLA's marketing group, which is things like the, you know, the Australian Day Lamb campaign that we see every January. 15 cents to Animal Health Australia, who coordinate kind of national biosecurity um, and emergency disease response on behalf of industry. And 8 cents into the National Residue Survey, which makes sure the product we're selling uh, meets specifications and meets standards for the markets we're selling into. Obviously those, those figures um, can also be seen for cattle as well as goats um, and there's that same breakdown between the different streams that levy is invested into. So in terms of how our industry comes up with priorities and where that money is then directed, how we decide what is a key priority to invest producer levies into, we've got two, two documents there on the right of the screen. So Red Meat 2030, which is the Meat Industry Strategic Plan, and next to that, the MLA strategic plan. So these two documents look at 10 and five years respectively and essentially set the really high level strategic goals for where we're trying to take um, industry into the future. So some of those things that, that I'm sure you've probably heard, or heard a bit about in the press recently are things like the intention to double the value of red meat sold by 2030. The other, the other point on this slide is the map of Australia I've got there, and we've heard a few references to SALRAC this morning. So you can see that green shaded area across southeast Australia. That represents the Southern Australian Livestock Research Council region, and there's two other research councils that do that same job in Australia, one in WA and one representing the northern beef industry. And what these groups do is put together an annual set of priorities that I guess put a, a more operational spin um, and alignment with those strategic plans that I've got sitting next to it. So taking that down a, another level again, you can see that there's a, a number of different smaller regions within SALRAC and that big light green chunk stretching from about Longreach to Wentworth in the middle is, is the um, spot we're sitting at the moment. So Gus White's the, the chair of that regional committee and has been for some time and I'd certainly recommend getting in touch with Gus and, and having a conversation about the opportunity to get involved there, um, because this is, this is really the point where producers as, as levy payers have the opportunity to really have a direct um, input into the priorities that really matter to them and their local communities and their regions and how levies are invested going forward. The other angle of that is obviously becoming an MLA member. So membership is free to all mm. levy payers. However, paying a levy doesn't automatically make you a member. And this is a bit of a tricky one just around um, what we're allowed to do with data from, from our levy payers. But it's really important to make sure you're signed up to this. Obviously, there's a few communication channels that you'll um, get to make sure you're kept up to date with what we're doing on behalf of industry. But it also means uh, you've got a vote at the annual general meeting. So uh, again, another point of direct involvement in where MLA is heading. Um, here I'm just going to dip into a, a couple of slides around national flock trends and markets, and this certainly isn't my area of expertise, so excuse me for not going into too much depth here. Um, 
but talking to Sally as we were organising today, uh, hopefully this is of interest to a, a few people. So this first slide here is Australia's sheep meat global markets. And the first point that I'd make there is whilst exports are, are obviously critical to, to not only sheep meat and red meat, but agriculture in general, the domestic Australian market is still by far the number one value market that we have at 2.16 billion last financial year. Following that, we've got North Asia, which is made up of about five different countries at 1.6 billion, uh, and then to North America at 1 billion. The other, other point I'd make on this slide is the diversity of markets we have. I think particularly in the context of a lot of other agricultural commodities, a real strength of the red meat industry is that we do have quite a diverse global marketplace that we operate in. And in the context of, of you know, the challenges that we face, um, whether they be geopolitical or, or pandemics or whatever else, having that diversity of markets really does um, add some resilience to the product we're selling and the, and the value we're getting for that product. This slide here is the national sheep flock and you can see the grey line there in 2019-20 where we reached the lowest national flock on record at 64 million head, which I'm sure is no surprises to anyone given the significant um, drought years we came through leading up to that. But I guess one of, the, one of the positive points coming out of that is the projected rebuild that we're now starting to enter with projections to get back up to about 74 million head by 2023. So this is obviously reliant on, on a few good seasons coming together, um, but also really ties into some of the management practices we've heard about today around reproduction. The, where, where I see kind of that, that context really getting interesting is when you start looking at the national lamb slaughter figures, and again, you can see the grey bar of, of 2020, and understandably, there's a fair dip there where we hit our, our low of national flock. But if you look at that figure across the last couple of years, and even if you want to look right back to the millennium drought, the, the national slaughter figure we've maintained over these last couple of years through a, a very significant drought has actually been quite stable and on a historical basis quite high. And you can also see that trend going forward with a projected rebuild. And the key factor in all of that is reproduction and weaning more lambs for every you join. So uh, you know we can see a bit of a theme through the talks of today from Laura and Sue and the importance that there is around that net reproductive rate on farm and the opportunity that is still there to be captured around reproduction. So whilst we're looking at this on a, on a national level and going by maintaining that lamb slaughter rate, we're able to make sure we're still supplying those markets, keeping those relationships um, active, but we can also bring that down right to a farm gate level and go, you know, it's those same drivers that are operating within an individual business in that by maximising our reproductive rate and by making sure that every lamb, that every ewe that's seeing a ram is weaning something, you're able to not only increase your flock and build those numbers up over time as you come out of drought, but also sell a product into the market and, and ultimately cash flow your business. So I'll go into something that's uh, a little more in my wheelhouse now, which is MLA's adoption pathway. And I guess this is how we see a lot of the research that's being done and the research industry invests in, how that then gets packaged up um, and made available to producers and, and hopefully implemented on farm. So we've got three key areas that our adoption programs sit in. The first one in the orange circle there is awareness activities, and that's days like today, forums where people can come together, get a, a broad range of information of the kind of work going on in industry and opportunities available to them, and then go home and, and decide the, the areas that are of real interest to them and how they can then follow up. I'll go through a couple of examples of these shortly. The next step there is short-term supported learning programs. Uh, this is only kind of one or two day programs with the key difference from awareness programs being that participants are expected to leave the day having gained new knowledge and skills that they can then go home and action. So whether that's a producer going home and making a change on farm or an advisor with new knowledge that they can then extend on to their clients. And finally, the long-term supported programs, and this is really where the rubber hits the road, I suppose, and where things like the producer demonstration sites, which Laura spoke about, fit in, in that these, these are programs that are ongoing for you know, a couple of months up to a couple of years, and really build capacity in, in 
um, participants by you know, working in groups, having kind of peer support to make sure people are learning from each other, bouncing ideas around together and ultimately supporting each other to make long-term practice change um, on farm. And finally, there are tools and enablers, which really works across those initial three pillars. Uh, and that's things like, uh, you know, we've got a number of decision support tools on the website, cost of production calculators, stocking rate calculators, things that can be accessed at any time that hopefully provide a bit of information to inform uh, decisions you're making on a, on a regular basis. So under the awareness raising banner, the meetup forums are, are one of the major events we hold in the south. Uh, these, were, these were supposed to get going in 2020, but as, as with most things, they had the brakes put on them. Uh, however, we have got them up and going this year. We had our first run of events a couple of months ago in Gawler, Cobar and Charleville. And there is a real focus with these events in getting some coverage and engagement in rangeland areas, which is really good to see. Uh, so some upcoming events there is Broken Hill and Port Augusta in June. Not a rangeland specific event, but there's also one coming up in Dubbo later in the year, I think September. Uh, and what these days are about is, is a really similar forum to this, where you'll hear from both researchers and producers, as well as local extension staff, about you know, practices people are, are using, successes people are having, and opportunities to, to get involved in programs going forward. On the short-term supported low program front, the example I'd give there that I, I think is probably most relevant to the people in the room is Breadwell Fedwell. So this is a one-day, quite practical workshop. It can be targeted to sheep or cattle. And the, the outcomes of this program are to be able to marry up, I guess, the genetic and nutrition components of a business to walk away with a clear breeding objective for where you want your herd or flock to go, the kind of product that you want to be selling, the kind of animal that fits the, the environment and the production system you're running, and then what the nutritional profile of, of that production system is. How do you actually feed that animal, feed your breeding animals, to make sure you're achieving the genetic potential that you've just been selecting for. Uh, so the, these workshops can be run anywhere as long as there's a group of, group of people willing to get involved. So um, Peter Schuster, Peter Schuster is the uh, national coordinator of this program. You can contact him directly if you're interested to get something like this up and running in your region or, or similarly get in touch with myself or, or MLA more broadly. The next one there, once we get into long-term supported learning programs, so I've already had a really good wrap-up of what a producer demonstration site looks like. The other component of, of this stream of programs is profitable grazing systems. And this is a, another long-term program involving groups of producers coming together around a specific technical topic that they would like to improve their knowledge on and implement in their business, uh, and doing so with both their peers and a, a coach or facilitator to guide them through some of that content. So these programs cover a range of topics, everything from, from grazing management to repro, all the way through to through business management and kind of management accounting, if that's what you're looking to upskill in. Um, with the key aspects of these programs being that group dynamic where people are learning from their peers and ultimately being held accountable by their peers to if we're all in this together when we're going to make some changes, then let's really get around each other and, and support each other through that change process. So one profitable grazing systems program that I wanted to specifically mention is called Improving Tactical Decision Making. And this has been developed quite recently by New South Wales DPI and Western Local Land Services. Uh, and it's just got underway in this last couple of months. The first group to go through this project um, is based in Oxley at the moment, and I, I believe they're a couple of months in. And the key components of this program are managing native pastures and animals that graze them to ultimately enhance the resource base and enhance livestock productivity. So what I mean by that is, uh, you know, capacity to assess a pasture and identify what your most productive plants are in that landscape, how you can manipulate your grazing management to increase the, the prevalence of those plants that are really valuable to you and your production system. And similarly on the livestock front, actually identifying you know, through tools, simple tools like condition scoring, what animals um, are in an appropriate condition score to, to achieve the production goals you've got, and then how can you reallocate feed within your pasture base to uh, best match that to animal demands. 
So Tanisha Shields, uh, she's based over in Bar Reynolds with LLS. She's currently running this project and would be the first point of call to get involved in that. Uh, or, or again, speak to myself, or I'm sure Sally can, can link people in with the appropriate, um, appropriate people too, if there's a group of people in your region that would like something like this. And I think this is a really, really good opportunity, this program, in that it really has been developed specifically for the southern rangelands of New South Wales. So in terms of having content that is locally relevant, um, I, I really do have, have faith that this program's on the money. The last little section of my talk I'm going to give, I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail about a specific project here, which is called Rangelands Living Skin. This is a, a project that was only contracted last year, so it's in its very, very early stages of getting going. It was producer initiated by a, a bunch of producers right across Western New South Wales that over a number of years had been identifying the need for a demonstration site or more demonstration sites in the region. So the producers had locally relevant data and kind of local sites that they could go from, go to and learn from, take information back home and help inform their management going forward. So rather than, it's certainly based around the, the traditional PDS um, producer demonstration site process in terms of a couple of on-farm trial sites. But this project probably takes it a step further in that there's also a, quite a significant research component built into that. And I think that's a real strength of this project in having producers right at the centre of that research being done in that it really ensures the outcomes of that work are commercially relevant and it really speeds up the adoption process by having producers involved in the implementation, the monitoring and evaluation of all that work right from, right from day one. Uh, the, the other strength of this project, in, in my opinion at least, uh, second to being so producer-centric, is the level of collaboration. So all, all the individuals and companies on this screen are involved in this project in some way. Um, obviously an MLA-funded project, DPI, New South Wales DPI, lead the project delivery. Susan Orgel out of Wagga is responsible for that. And importantly, uh, the four core producers, which we've got listed across the top, Gus and Kelly White, Andrew and Megan Mosley, Tony and Meredith Thompson, and Graham and Cathy Finlayson, who not only have research sites on their properties, uh, but have also played a really active role over the last couple of years in developing this project into what it is now and making sure it's something that can add value to the region. So this map we've got here is the, the four core producer sites we've got. So they're spread all the way from Brewarrina to Wentworth, just about. And over the next 12 months, we also intend to engage an additional 20 observer producers in this project, um, which I'll come back to in a little bit in terms of how you guys can get directly involved. In terms of the aim of the project, so the, the bit of text there is the, the formal project aim that's written up in the project scope. I guess it's, a, it's an interesting project in that in some ways it's quite simple what we want to do, but it's also very broad in that we're really looking at measuring and understanding a number of practices in how they impact the environmental condition of the resource base for managing, livestock productivity and business performance. So it, it's quite a, a whole systems approach there with the underlying premise that none of those three factors can really succeed without the other two coming with them. So some of the treatments we're involving in this project, and none of the treatments have actually been implemented yet. This first year we're undertaking a, a bit of baseline measurement and getting the, the trial really set up to go. I see the treatments fitting into two streams. So I've kind of got the, the fairly well established, well recognised practices that are fairly common in the region. Things like various grazing management strategies, uh, fencing to, to better manage non-domestic livestock, your goats and kangaroos and things like that, and landscape interventions, so water ponding, water spreading, um, and some of that earthwork uh, type products. So these things are, are all, all not necessarily common practice, but practiced in various forms right across the region. And I guess the value of having them in a project like this is not only having a formal demonstration site for people to come and see if they're interested to learn more, but also gather some quite rigorous data around the, the impact they're having on pastoral businesses. The second stream of treatments there is a bit more blue sky. So things like multi-species plantings and biological inoculants, thinking like targeted compost um, applications or 
compost extracts as a means of really stimulating and kick-starting biological processes in the soil, which obviously drive the production system. So these are things that are starting to get a little more attention in the inside country, um, but are yet to have a big body of research behind them, and certainly yet to have a lot of work done in the rangelands. So quite exciting to have um, some more novel practices like this included in the project. The measurements we're taking for this project, they obviously reflect the treatments that we've got. They cover a few key areas being soils, pastures, livestock, economics and carbon. And when I say carbon, thinking not only uh, the carbon balance of a pastoral business, actually getting an idea of whether a pastoral business is a net producer or net sequester of greenhouse gases, and then taking that a step further to go, pending that outcome, is there a market opportunity for producers to actually be selling an ecosystem service here beyond the, the biological benefits of increasing carbon in soils through water holding capacity and the like. In terms of frequency of these kind of measurements, um, there's quite a range. Things like stocking rate and rainfall use efficiency are being captured through an online program called My Grazing, and that's being input by producers, so that's pretty regular and pretty frequent. Things like a lot of the pasture measurements and soil measurements will happen twice a year. Uh, economics will be done once a year on a whole farm benchmarking program, Profit Probe, which is run by RCS. And then carbon accounting and life cycle assessments will be done once over the life of the project. In terms of monitoring methods, there's also a fair range here, all the way from the really simple stuff that, that we could all do, throw a square out in the paddock and count the plants and identify what species you've got present in your pasture, uh, right the way through to, to quite, um, quite serious technology with, with satellite imagery identifying you know, bare ground, ground cover, woody weed versus versus actual um, palatable ground cover. Is it actively growing or is it dried and hayed off? So the outcomes of this project, there are quite a number of outcomes that we, we hope to get out of this body of work. I've, I've picked out just a handful to put on this slide that I think capture the real essence of the project in that we're trying to tie together those three points of landscape, health and function livestock productivity and business performance to say how do we create a really resilient and productive pastoral system. So very much specific to the southern rangelands, whilst it's based in western New South Wales, I think it'll, it'll really have relevance across um, Queensland, SA and Western Australia in, in different ways and shapes. And I guess this program, going back to the adoption pathway that I showed earlier, we try and embed that through this whole project. So. You've got the research component where we're, we're genuinely creating new knowledge for industry and producers involved, some new information that people can then act on. We've got some heavy involvement with coaching processes and workshops throughout the program, building capacity of both participants, producers and advisors, uh, and that ongoing support of being in a networked producer group to not only, um, I guess, assess the practices being put in place, but identify which ones of those really work for you and your business and, and making sure you can implement those effectively. So the last one for me, and, and probably most importantly, is how to get involved in this project. So we've recently put a page up on our website that gives a, a quick overview of what this project involves. It's also got Susan Orgel's contact details on that page. She's the project lead, so feel free to get in touch with her directly if you'd like to know more about it and ask any questions. Uh, and there's also an expression of interest open for observer producers to get involved. So similar to Laura's project, the observer producers will play a slightly less intense role to what the core producers will play, but ultimately they're, they're still involved in you know, the ability to replicate trials on another property. If, if you've got one or two practices, you're already implementing at home or would like to give a try, um, then maybe this is a really good opportunity to have the support of a research team who can help you put a monitoring process in place to actually decide whether that's something that fits for your business and adds value to what you're doing or whether it's, uh, it's not of use. So I guess um, uh, the only real criteria around getting involved as an observer producer is managing country in the Western Division, number one and having the, the capacity and intention 
to provide that data back into the project. So ultimately there needs to be data collected on your farm in your business that contributes to the broader data set of the project. There's also a lot of training uh, workshops and the like that will be run through this project and the core producers and observer producers will, will get first shot at that. Certainly we'll, we'll make sure those events are filled up with anyone else in the region who's interested. Um, but by getting involved at that higher level, we'd, we'd certainly prioritise your involvement. If you're interested in what the project's doing and what it's got to offer, but not quite at, at the point of getting directly involved, you can also just enter your details um, and you'll receive the odd email with an update on the project, whether we've got workshops and field days coming up, or, or you know, as the project progresses and results start becoming seen, you'll also see some of that information communicated through those channels. And then obviously we'll also have the annual field days and, and case studies and media that everyone can get around. But look, this is, this is a project I'm really excited about. Um, it was a project I had a little bit of involvement with prior to moving to MLA, and I was really glad to be able to keep an involvement with it in this new role. Uh, I just think ultimately it's a really good opportunity to see research done within the region and the opportunity for producers to get direct access to people that really are leading scientists and consultants in our industry. Um, is not something that, that comes around a lot, so I, I think it's a great opportunity to really capitalise on that. So look, that's all, all for me. I have to take a few questions. Okay, Ron? Ron. Um, I'm just wondering, what's the time frame for a project such as that? Yeah, so that's a four-year project um, that'll run through to 2024. And I guess all those, a any project like that, there's, well, we keep a bit of flexibility in mind that if, as the project progresses and results and outcomes start coming through and there's clear reason, there's clear value to expand that project geographically or, or you know, extending time, adding in different treatments, things like that, then there's opportunity to do that. Uh, but at this stage, it's a four-year project. Things like your standard PDSs, they are, I think, a minimum two years, maximum six years. And, and uh, I think that getting that time scale is really important in this part of the world too, where you know, if, if you do have a, a run of dry years, then it really knocks out your capacity to get replication over time. Yeah, good night, Mitch. Where are we looking? Oh, here we are. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I know it's early, but what are you finding about carbon uh, sequestration or anything like that in the rangelands? Yeah, so Susan, Susan Orgle, who's leading this project, is, is really the, um, a, a leader in that space. She's done a, a lot of the past work in rangeland environments and, and rangeland soils around soil carbon. Uh, the crux of it, as I understand, is that there is capacity to sequester carbon in rangeland soils like there is anywhere else. Obviously with the rainfall gradient, the amount of carbon over a given amount of time that can be sequestered is reduced, but we've got a huge scale to spread that over. So it's really the ability to tie a management practice to that change, which is going to be a key question of this project. Can a management practice influence the rate of sequestration? And then can, do we have the capacity to measure it accurately enough to actually plot that reliably over time. Yeah, look, I, I'm probably talking a bit out of my league here, not being a, a research scientist myself. Um, it, it's a, an area of work that's evolving pretty rapidly. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure everyone's heard about some of the projects recently where producers have sold upwards of half a million bucks worth of carbon to companies like Microsoft. So there's methodologies out there. Um, there's also the Australian Government Emissions Reduction Fund methodology, which has its own set of rules and regulations. So it's a, it's a quickly moving space. But yes, there's, there's areas where, where people have measured it. It just depends whether the, the bodies you're working with recognise that as a reliable method or not. Yeah, Mitch, um, just wondering if MLA had any other programs, apart from days like today, to link future researchers, such as university students, with producers to build those relationships and, and you know, abilities to work together going forward? 
Yeah, thanks, Gus. Um, I'm thinking probably at the university student level, probably not so much. A program that we do have at the moment that is gaining a little bit of momentum is our Livestock Advisor Essentials and Livestock Advisor updates. So they're really targeted at early career livestock advisors. Um, so whether they be private or, or government agency advisors, um, to link them in with not only professional networks, but recent research and, um, and information that they can then take forward to clients. We do have, on, on the research front, we do provide a PhD scholarship, um, so there's some opportunity there. And similarly with, with projects like this and other projects, there's often space to have a, an honours student or, or PhD student involved. Gus, I'll, um, I mean, sorry, Mitch, I'll finish up with the last question. Um, but just leading on from the question over here about the carbon sequestration, do you hope out of that four-year project that you will come up with a, a, um, a formula to be able to interpret carbon sequestration out, particularly Gus's place out at Wentworth? Do you, was that one of the outcomes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's the still, still question marks within the project team of whether four years is long enough to be able to pick that up, and, and I guess that'll be seen. Um, and, re and results as we go will probably guide that conversation as to whether there needs to be longer time to be able to detect those uh, changes. But yeah, that's certainly an intended outcome of the project and a big part of that will be having conversations with those involved in, in ecosystem service markets um, in terms of how a methodology can be matched to actually monetise that change in carbon if we can find one. Yep. Any more questions for Mitch? Over here. Um, I'm not sure if I missed it, but how many um, producers did you say were going to be in that Living Skin project? So four core producers. So they're where our, our kind of mainstay replicated trials will be based, and then an additional 20 um, in, a, in a smaller capacity. So we'll probably have some greater replication on their places uh, or, or smaller scale programs that need less intensive measurement, so 24 all up. Okay, thank you. I think we're done. Oh no, still going. Um, just in terms of the application of the treatments, uh, are the producers you're working with, are they already in practice of those treatments or is it something that you're going to ask them to transition to in order to be able to measure and monitor that? Yeah, a bit of both. So some, some treatments like grazing management, some producers have been practicing um, various forms of grazing management for you know, upwards of 10 years. Uh, and a lot of those project sites have actually had past research done on them too. So we do have the benefit of some historical data there as well. Uh, we'd also be using kind of paired replicates there. So rather than having a practice implemented now, if a practice has been implemented for a number of years, let's find a site in a comparable landscape that hasn't had that practice uh, implemented previously. Uh, but similarly, some of, some of the other treatments will be implemented for the first time next year. I think you're done, Mitch. Thanks, Alan. Um, please, th everybody, thank Mitch. Now, we're doing really well time-wise, so, which is fantastic.